So in this lecture, we're going to look at a couple of other um, artists who kind of fall into this classification of avant-garde in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. So symbolism was an avant-garde movement that developed in the mid-1880s and kind of lasted until maybe about 1910. Um, and it really first developed as a literary movement, but it was quickly adapted to visual art as well. Symbolism was championed by a loose affiliation of artists who believed that art should represent truths and that that could only be described sort of indirectly. They rejected the value placed on rationalism and material progress and instead chose to explore the fantastical, sometimes even horrifying realms of emotion and imagination, seeking a deeper, more mysterious reality beyond everyday life. They sought to make visual art that, like poetry or music, did not depict the world literally, but rather conveyed meaning using powerful yet sort of strangely ambiguous subject matter and stylized forms that suggest a sort of hidden or elusive symbolic meaning instead of using naturalistic representation. The symbolists, like many other avant-garde groups, really valued quite highly individual expression. And so this is, again, not a single unified style. Um, many of them sought to sort of escape the irrational aspects of the human mind. Um, and they wanted to kind of include images from their dreams and psychological states, um, extreme unrestrained emotions, imagination, and elements of spirituality. Um, in fact, some scholars often place Gauguin into this symbolist group. Um, sometimes these artists did pull from biblical, literary, or mythological subjects, but they usually approach them in a new and sort of unusual ways. Um, Gustav Kahn, a symbolist poet kind of involved in this group, he explains, quote, the essential aim of our art is to objectify the subjective instead of subjectifying the objective. And so here he kind of means that they really sought to externalize their inner thoughts and emotions to strongly impact their viewer rather than simply recreating nature as seen through their eyes. And so these symbolist compositions are often rather ambiguous and somewhat open to interpretation. Gustave Moreau was an academic artist who the symbolists sort of looked to as a precursor. Um, in his later works, such as this one, The Apparition, from about 1874 to 76, he creates these intense kind of vision-like atmospheres with rich colors, high levels of detail, and strong emotional and psychological expressions. This particular work illustrates a story from the Gospel of Mark of Salome, a young Judean princess who, with the encouragement of her mother, performed an erotic dance for her stepfather, the King Herod. Then when Herod offers Salome anything she wants as a reward, um, her mother again encourages her and kind of has her to demand the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so Herod had him imprisoned at the time and Salome's mother was angry that he had said her marriage to Herod was unlawful. Um, so Gustave Moreau here presents us with not a specific scene from the biblical narrative, but more of his imagination of the moment following Salome's demand for John's head. So we see Salome standing um, rather seductively with her mother and the king kind of in the background here. Um, John's head appears to her floating kind of in midair, dripping blood and radiating this holy light. The other figures in the scene don't really seem to be aware of its presence like Salome is. Maybe her mother is, but really only those two. There's a certain level of ambiguity here. Is this maybe meant to be some sort of mystical vision that Salome received? Um, the soldier here in the background, he has a sword, which maybe refers to the physical act of beheading the prisoner. Um, but in general, Moreau kind of depicts the sensual yet macabre scene and its exotic setting in meticulous detail with a relatively limited color palette, but with touches of jewel tones, creating a decadent atmosphere very well suited for the seductive Salome. And so he kind of emphasizes her role as a femme fatale or a woman whose sexual allure is so appealing that it's also dangerous to the men she attracts. So in this case, 
Salome is so sexually appealing that Herod gives her whatever she wants, which happens to be the death of another man. Symbolism was very much an international movement, and while it developed first in France, it quickly appeared elsewhere, and it often took on expressionist tendencies, adopting very rough gestural brushwork and bold colors, as in the work of the Norwegian artist Edvard Munch. Munch produced a substantial body of work that gives shape to the inner psyche of modern humanity, and he tends to visualize his own feelings and responses to his life experiences. So the themes of this work, The Storm from 1863, these revolve around ideas of light and dark, internal and external. We have this strong contrast between the warm interior light that sort of emanates from the windows of this house and then the darker, cooler tones in the exterior space. We sort of get the sense of a strong wind blowing against the tree here. And then we have these figures um, kind of bracing themselves against the wind as well. Um, kind of a dark, gloomy looking sky, almost as if this storm is kind of gathering and bringing with it this ominous, brooding atmosphere. There's a sort of green tinge to the sky, maybe meant to represent the aurora borealis or the northern lights that would have been visible in this um, kind of Norwegian area. We have these loose sort of abstracted figures that are huddled kind of down here near the water's edge. Um, Monk made this while he was staying at a small Norwegian seaside resort, and so he's very likely based this on groups of women that he had witnessed gathering near the water to kind of watch for their husbands returning from long sea voyages. And so the figures here, simplified as they are, they still kind of communicate this, you know, this fatigue, um, sort of leaning on one another for support. And then we have a, a lone figure kind of stepping forward here, wearing white um, in a stark contrast to the surrounding scene. And so she sort of holds this extremely symbolic weight, communicating at once this sense of unfaltering hope, but also anxious, impatient despair. In sketches, paintings, pastels, and prints, Munch continually tapped into the depths of his feelings to examine various aspects of human life, including the various stages of development, ideas of anxiety, dread, loneliness, jealousy, sexuality, loss, and um, ultimately this practice evolved into a project that he called his Freeze of Life. And that project included his most famous work, The Scream. Um, and so this is actually one of several versions of this work or this motif that he did, um, depicting this uh, scene of a bridge that kind of extends at a rather steep angle away from the central humanoid figure. Um, and then we have this landscape in the background kind of showing the um, curving shoreline of the fjord, uh, low-lying hills in the distance, all underneath this sky of harsh swirling lines and colors. So again, Munch is really trying to express internal emotions and states of being through formal creativity. When he first published this work in a Parisian magazine in 1895, he included this text. One evening, I was walking along a path. The city was on one side and the fjord below. I was tired and ill. I stopped and leaned against the balustrade, almost dead with fatigue. Above the blue-black fjord hung the clouds, red as blood and tongues of fire. My friends had left me, and alone, trembling with anguish, I became aware of the vast, infinite cry of nature. Here's one more example of Munch's works. Um, again, these come from the Freeze of Life series, and so again, this is a motif that he's done several different versions of. And so we have two different media here. We have um, a lithograph and woodcut print from 1895 to about 1902, and then we also have this oil and canvas version from about 1895. Um, in both, we have a man kind of in black laying with his head in the lap of this woman with very long red hair that sort of cascades around their embrace as she leans over him, and they're both surrounded by these rather intense shadows. 
Now, Munch originally titled this work Love and Pain, and I think that really emphasizes the sort of tenderness of the loving couple's embrace, and it suggests this idea that the man has turned to this woman in a moment of extreme emotional desperation for support. Maybe she's meant to be some sort of angelic lover, or maybe some sort of comforting motherly figure. However, his art critic friend saw the painting at an exhibition in 1893, and he described it as, quote, a man who has become submissive and on his neck a biting vampire's face. And so even though Monk maintained that it was really no more than a woman kissing a man on the neck, the nickname stuck, and his subsequent iterations of this theme were usually titled Vampire. And so the, the name really changes the meaning here because the composition itself is quite ambiguous, kind of open to interpretation. Love and pain is sort of a sweet and tender scene. Again, a man kind of in the comforting embrace of a loving woman. But Vampire immediately transforms the loving, empathetic woman into this dangerous femme fatale who is consuming this poor man entirely. So up until the late 19th and early 20th centuries, European artists didn't tend to experiment as radically in the medium of sculpture as they did in two-dimensional media. The demand for sculptures mostly came in the form of commissions from either large public institutions or private middle class or upper middle class patrons. Um, both of those wanted conventional, classically inspired, academically styled figurative works. However, we do start to see in the late 19th century a couple French sculptors who adopt this defiance of conventional expectations and they start to show interest in the emotional expressiveness that characterized avant-garde painting and so they really start to explore the rather passionate physicality of the human form. And so the most prominent of these was Auguste Rodin, who is often considered the father of modern sculpture. Rodin was born in Paris in 1840, and during his early career, he was denied admittance to the École des Beaux-Arts three separate times, and so he spent about 20 years as an assistant to other sculptors and decorators. After a trip to Italy in 1875, where he admired the sculpture of Donatello and Michelangelo, Rodin developed a new, innovative style that is rather hard to categorize as it connects with Impressionism, Symbolism, and Expressionism. In a lot of ways, he does maintain sculptural conventions. Um, he worked mostly by commission, and his works are figurative, tending to pull grand themes from history, the Bible, and literature. However, rather than presenting highly idealized, classically inspired heroic figures, he instead presents vigorously modeled figures in unconventional and even awkward poses. His figures retain extreme anatomical accuracy, but he was very interested in the expressive effects of um, distortion, and so he wanted his forms to be kind of suggestive of emotions and ideas, and he wanted to leave them open to various interpretations. Now, most of Rodin's works are bronze casts, meaning he would have had to first make a full-scale 3D model in clay, um, and then from that, they would make a mold using plaster. Molten bronze could then be poured into the plaster mold, um, and they could produce the final sculpture, the final metal work. Now, like many other sculptors of this period, Rodin saw the making of sculpture as a collaborative process. He employed highly trained plaster casters, carvers and founders, as well as studio assistants to turn his models into finished works that push the boundaries of sculpture in new and radical ways. Rodin often had several casts made of an original, allowing him to create a number of different versions, as well as to cut casts up as a means of working out further possibilities. Over time, he built up a huge repertoire of plaster molds and models, using them to devise new figurative combinations and juxtapositions, or to find fresh solutions to compositional problems. When modeling his forms in clay, Rodin used his fingers to create an uneven, rather spontaneous texture across the surface, unlike the traditionally smooth, unblemished surfaces of ancient, renaissance, and neoclassical sculptures. 
This rough surface texture creates an interesting play of light and shadow across the final bronze figure and really gives his works a sense of dynamic energy or motion, and it often helps to enhance the emotional expression. Notice here on this walking man how the texture enhances the curvature of the calf and the abdominal muscles um, and really, again, gives the figure a sense that it's truly kind of striding forward through space. Rodin was also radically innovative in that he exhibited partial figures. Again, notice here with the walking man, we have no arms and no head. This is kind of commonly seen in ancient sculpture, but not because the artists had intended it that way, but rather because of damage that's happened in the kind of period since they were created. Contemporary artists created partial figures as studies, but they never used them as the finished product. So the walking man here really introduced radical notions of sculptural truncation and assembly into the modern artistic canon. It's composed of a fragmented torso attached to legs that were made for a different figure, and the work is neither organically functional nor physically whole. But the artist considered it finished because it captured the essence of movement. In 1884, Rodin won a commission from the city of Calais in France for a work that would commemorate a local event from the Hundred Years' War in 1347. The King of England at the time, Edward III, had invaded the city and offered to spare everyone if six burghers or leading citizens of the city would voluntarily sacrifice themselves to be executed. Now, ultimately, Queen Philippa, who, she convinced Edward to pardon the men who sacrificed themselves, but Rodin's Burgers of Calais depicts a moment before that pardon had been announced. Now, I believe Rodin was originally commissioned to create just a single figure, but he has ambitiously created all six figures grouped together, likely because he wasn't so much concerned with a specific narrative or the idea of individual heroism as he was with using these men as symbols of self-sacrifice for the common good. And so in this figural group, each individual is rather vigorously modeled. They're larger than life, dressed in heavy sackcloth and barefoot. Several of them have ropes around their necks, and one of them, right here, holds a large key, symbolizing the key to the city, which they delivered to King Edward. Rodin has heightened the figure's monumentality by um, enlarging their hands, their heads, and their feet. Um, he's also really stylized the forms for expressive purposes, trying to emphasize the psychological and emotional toll of their decision, drawing attention to the sort of exaggerated emotions that convey fear, despair, doubt, and solemn resignation. Highly unified and closely arranged, the figures sometimes touch, and yet the burgers seem to be isolated from each other by their unique, often energetic poses and gestures. Now, upon its completion, several of the city's leaders didn't think that this work was heroic enough, but Rodin was really purposefully emphasizing that these are not calm, idealized heroes, but rather ordinary people who've sort of stepped up to perform this noble act. While it was originally intended to be placed up on top of a pedestal, like a more traditional sculpture would be, um, and like most sculpture is, um, in a way that would maybe increase its heroic status, Rodin instead wanted it to be installed on the street level, uh, kind of promoting a more direct personal interaction with the viewer and really allowing them to see the details of the facial expressions and understand the tension and pathos that he's trying to communicate. Another prominent avant-garde French sculptor active in the late 19th and early 20th centuries was Camille Claudel. Between 1882 and 1898, Claudel was first a student of Auguste Rodin, then she worked as his model and his assistant, and then eventually she became his lover. Claudel specialized in sculpted portraits and figural groups, and she was pretty successful, but it was quite difficult for her oftentimes to sort of get the recognition that she deserved as an individual artist because she was very much in Rodin's shadow. She created her most well-known work, The Waltz, in several different versions and sizes between 1892 and 1905. 
The one here is relatively small in its cast of bronze. It depicts a couple dancing the waltz, which was at the time a very controversial dance in and of itself because it demanded such close bodily contact between the dancers. Claudel's two figures are seemingly fusing into a single form as they dance and spin through space. The male figure is completely nude, as is the woman's torso, and Claudel actually intended for both figures to be fully nude, but after an inspector from the Ministry of Fine Arts declared the work's sensuality to be unacceptable, she conceded and added this um, kind of long flowing drapery to the woman's lower half. Now, I think that really speaks to the gendered biases of the art world because August Rodin quite commonly depicted fully nude figures, often in rather odd, sensual, or revealing positions, like with this work, Iris, Messenger of the Gods, but he was never criticized for being overly sensual or erotic in the way that Camille Claudel was as a female artist. But ultimately, Claudel has kind of, you know, embraced this flowing drapery and used it to enhance the sensuality of the sculpture, kind of giving it this sort of organically textured surface and allowing it to add to the illusion of twirling, joyful movement. Like Rodin, Claudel is maybe somewhat hard to categorize because her works tend to have impressionist, symbolist, and expressionist connections. Now, there's no concrete evidence that, um, this, that this work had anything to do with her romantic relationship to Rodin, but many have interpreted it that way, um, kind of assuming that um, because she was a woman, she would have had a greater, almost uncontrollable emotional reaction that she would have expressed in her work. Um, but again, there's no concrete evidence for that, and she never claimed that this work had anything to do with her own relationship. I think it's maybe more appropriate to acknowledge the more universal symbolist leanings here and how she's kind of left the composition open to interpretation. Um, some viewers have interpreted it as two souls escaping the bounds of gravity or maybe escaping the confinement of the human body, while others feel that it expresses the feeling of losing oneself in another person. After her relationship with Rodin ended, Claudel experienced modest professional success. Some scholars note that she often blamed Rodin when she didn't receive official commissions, accusing him of blackballing her and stealing her ideas. Following several years of eccentric behavior by Claudel, including a period in which she destroyed many of her own artworks, um, her family committed her to a psychiatric hospital in 1913. Her career as an artist ended and she remained institutionalized for the remaining 30 years of her life, despite the medical staff's repeated recommendations to her family that she be released. So in the 1890s, we also see the development of an international style of art, architecture, and applied design known as Art Nouveau. These artists and architects embraced modern industrial materials, but in general, they rejected the functional aesthetic and the rational order of the industrial world. Instead, they drew inspiration from the natural world, particularly the most untamed or unruly aspects, although they were also interested in Asian calligraphy and ceramics, as well as past European styles like the Gothic and Rococo. Natural motifs of flowers, foliage, vines, winged insects, snakes, etc. These were popular because of their delicate, sinuous forms and the graceful aesthetic. Um, many incorporate a rather distinctive, undulating or flowing line that we refer to as a whiplash curve, which is often seen as a metaphor for the freedom from the weight of the artistic traditions and criticisms. The goal of Art Nouveau was really to harmonize all aspects of design into an integrated whole, as found in nature itself. So again, stylistic characteristics include exotic motifs from nature, uh, flowing curvilinear lines, and also simple yet boldly outlined forms, um, prominent patterns, and asymmetrical compositions. 
Art Nouveau architecture specifically is a synthesis of nature and industry. And so again, especially in architecture, the Art Nouveau artists and designers embraced modern materials, especially things like glass, um, iron, concrete, terracotta, and um, colorfully glazed tiles. But again, they rejected the functional aesthetic. Belgian architect Victor Horta is probably most responsible for developing Art Nouveau architecture. He was actually an academically trained neoclassical architect for several years before he branched out on his own. He was apparently inspired by stylized linear designs, which were popular in the English arts and crafts movement, and he embraced those modern materials on interiors, exteriors, and in the furnishings of his structures. His first major commission came in 1892, a private residence in Brussels for one Professor Emile Tassel, and so we refer to this structure as Horta's Tassel House. Um, his design here was highly innovative and original, and he's used iron extensively for both structural and decorative functions. So we're looking at the entryway here, and you can kind of see his use of iron in the stair rail, as well as in the sort of slender columns that support the second story. The ironwork, as well as the mosaic tile floor and the wall decorations, include asymmetrical sinuous tendrils and graceful whiplash curves. Here are a few other um, kind of angles of the tassel house here, where you can see that he's also incorporated several large organically shaped windows, some of which include stained glass. And so the spacious interior is really flooded with natural light. There's quite a bit of ornamentation throughout, but he's not trying to hide the industrial materials or functional structure, but instead he's really, again, fusing nature and industry together and making something new. The Art Nouveau interest in graceful linearity, natural forms, and industrial materials quickly spread across Europe, reaching its height between about 1890 and 1920. In Spain, where the style was simply called Modernismo, the most prominent practitioner was the architect Antoni Gaudi. He integrated natural forms into his designs, and they, the structures that he made um, they're typically celebrated for their dynamic, kind of free-flowing lines. Um, in 1904, Gaudi was commissioned by a wealthy industrialist for a private residence that would surpass those of other upper-class families in Barcelona in terms of lavishness and luxury. So for this structure, Gaudi retained the existing underlying framework, but he's remodeled the facade and the interior space. And so the final Casa Batlo is a rather fantastical, dreamlike structure consisting of undulating sculpted sandstone and multicolored glass and tile surfaces. He's adopted modern industrial materials here, but in a way that sort of creatively mixes Barcelona's prominent Islamic, Gothic, and Baroque visual traditions. Um, the lower windows have often been described as gaping mouths, and so some people call this the house of yawns. And then the vertical supports have sometimes been described as looking like giant human bones. They are um, sculpted from sandstone, and so some people call this the house of bones. Um, also notice the irregularly shaped um, kind of roof line here with its overlapping multicolored glazed tiles and then a single turret kind of protruding upwards. And so in this, many people see maybe a giant sleeping dragon kind of laying on top of the building and the tiles become his scales. And then some even relate the vertical turret here to a sword that's been stabbed through the dragon's back. Here's another example of Gaudi's architectural design, although this time, instead of a single private residence, we have an entire apartment block in Barcelona called Casa Mila. Um, so here he's using the sort of sculptural modeling of the limestone exterior to create a fantastical undulating structure of continuously curving organic shapes, which creates this rather interesting play of light and shadow. The raw limestone slabs were attached to the underlying structure and worked into shape by stonemasons on site. 
These have no load-bearing function. They're purely an aesthetic feature, but there are curved steel beams kind of embedded within that attach and help support the weight of the stone. The result is an irregular organic stone facade that appears to have been carved directly from a rocky cliffside, and that has led some people to refer to this structure as La Pedrera, or the quarry. Um, Gaudi also includes about 150 irregularly shaped windows placed asymmetrically across the facade, as well as individually carved balconies with unique wrought iron railing. And again, he's really fused nature with industrial materials. The Art Nouveau style was especially influential for applied arts, illustration, and graphic design. Aubrey Beardsley, a British illustrator and designer, had a significant impact on book illustration and poster design. Beardsley championed individuality, eccentricity, and freedom of expression, and he tended to depict the decadent, erotic, and grotesque. His black ink drawings are quite striking with their um, sinuous decorative lines and the dramatic contrast of black and white, um, kind of influenced by natural forms as well as Japanese woodcut prints, and these have really been imitated quite widely. Um, this particular work is one of 16 illustrations that Beardsley did for his friend Oscar Wilde's tragic play titled Salome, which, again, was based on that Christian biblical story. Now, I referenced this um, a moment ago when we were talking about Gustave Miro's symbolist work, The Apparition. Um, but again, this is a story about Salome, a beautiful Jewish princess, the stepdaughter of King Herod. Um, and so she dances for him, and when he offers her anything, she wants as a reward. Again, at the encouragement of her mother, Salome asks for the head of John the Baptist, whom King Herod had imprisoned at the time. Um, her mother was upset that John had said her marriage to King Herod was unlawful. And then also, I think in Oscar Wilde's play, Salome had heard John um, singing and praying to God from his cell earlier in the evening. And when she um, went and found him and he turned down her sexual advances, she vowed that she would kiss his mouth no matter what. And so she requests the head of John the Baptist on a platter, and Herod really has no no choice but to oblige. And so as with Moreau's depiction, Salome is presented by Beardsley here as a femme fatale, both sexually alluring and dangerous. And so Beardsley's illustration presents a moment kind of just after Salome has kissed John's uh, decapitated head. She's rather insect-like here with sort of snake or tentacle-like hair floating above the ground, holding John's head um, as it drips this thick black blood down to the ground where it pools and we have these um, exotic flowers that are kind of sprouting from it. Overall, the composition is very characteristic of Art Nouveau with these repeating curvilinear forms and organic lines, the asymmetry, the bold patterns, and the natural motifs. Another prominent artist associated with the Art Nouveau style was Henri de Toulouse-Lautrec. He was from an aristocratic family from southern France, but he was born with a genetic condition that stunted his growth and left him physically disabled, and so he often felt that he did not fit in with his family or with aristocratic social circles. In 1882, at the age of 18, Toulouse-Lautrec moved to Paris, where he was inspired by the work of Edgar Degas, and where, more importantly, he discovered the working-class entertainment district of Montmartre, which was home to a rather exciting and sometimes immoral nightlife, including cafes, theaters, dance halls, brothels, etc. And so the Montmartre area was really this hub of bohemian avant-garde artists, writers, writers, performers, and others who lived alternative lifestyles and kind of disregarded conventional morality and, more specifically, the academic art-making traditions. From the 1880s onward, he dedicated himself to depicting the nightlife of Montmartre, and his works are generally based on first-hand experiences and observations, though they are rather highly stylized. Between 1891 and 1901, Toulouse-Lautrec produced about 30 color lithographic posters advertising the most popular entertainers at various businesses in the district. Um, on the 
left here, we have perhaps the most well-known of these lithographic posters, which depicts Jane Avril, a well-known dancer who is quite famous for her flexibility. Um, he's shown her performing on a stage that recedes sharply into the background. Um, and then we have the hand um, and part of the face of the double bass player and part of his instrument and some of the pages of sheet music kind of appearing in the foreground here um, near the lower right. The bold foreshortening, cropping, and asymmetrical um, aspects of this composition recall Edgar Degas' works. Um, but Toulouse-Lautrec is really sort of emphasizing Jane Avril's sexuality here in an effort to draw a larger crowd to the performance. Um, he's made her dance the can-can on stage here, which was a very high energy kind of physically demanding dance that was considered particularly scandalous in the 19th century because the female dancers would quite often wear pantalettes, which are sort of... Um, open crotched underwear or or shorts underneath their skirts and so when they did the high kicks they were very intentionally revealing themselves to the crowd. Um, stylistically, Toulouse-Lautrec tends to flatten spaces and forms. He uses bold, somewhat simplified outlines and broad areas of pure color with little to no modeling. In part, this was to accommodate the cheap color lithographic printing technique he was using, um, but the bold silhouettes and curving lines are also distinctly Art Nouveau in style. Um, now, on the right here, we have another ad for a cafe concert hall called Divan Japonais. Um, and so here, again, just using intricate lines and um, just four colors here, Toulouse-Lautrec kind of draws um, the very exciting atmosphere of this space. Again, he's compressed his forms, simplified his shapes, and he's using lively curvilinear um, outlines that are rather reminiscent of organic plant life motifs, as well as broad areas of flat, kind of solid color, radical cropping, and asymmetry. I think he's really drawing inspiration, again, from Edgar Degas and this Art Nouveau in general, but he's also thinking pretty specifically about Japanese ukiyo-e prints. Um, this advertisement um, features two of his favorite Montmartre stars. Um, so we have Jane Avril again, although now she is a spectator rather than a performer. And so she is seated in the foreground with this man whose name was Edward um, Duarden. He was a bourgeoisie writer and a nightclub regular here. Um, then in the upper kind of left corner on the stage, um, we see the headless body of another performer, Yvette Goubert. Um, and she was, again, very popular and she's recognizable by these trademark long black gloves and her rather slender, gaunt physique. Um, and so again, these Art Nouveau artists were very interested in modern life and maybe more so in terms of architecture, modern materials, but also the sort of lively, free-flowing lines and organic shapes of nature, which Toulouse-Lautrec here adopts to create a very dynamic representation of Parisian bohemian nightlife.